Hi, this is Ron Coddington from Military Images Magazine, checking in on a Sunday evening. I hope that all of you had a terrific and uh, great, enjoyable weekend. Um, I spent part of the weekend working on some Civil War projects, as you might imagine. The biggest one is the next issue of the magazine, our autumn issue which is closing this week, which means all of the stories are laid out, everything has been proofed and edited, and it will be sent to the printer late this week, and then the printer will do their thing and drop it in the mail uh, in sometime in early September. And so you should have it at that point. So um, thought I would uh, um, drop in tonight just to let you know about that. But I also want to talk about the photograph, the carte de visite that you see here. Um, I was doing a little bit of research this morning on this particular photograph, uh, which appeared in uh, a previous issue of the magazine. I was revisiting it and looking at some of the notes and the research I did at the time. And the photograph and the story stuck with me all day um, as I was doing other tasks. And if a story stays with you for that long, um, at least if it stays with me for that long, I figure ah, I should probably talk about it. So um, this is a little bit of talk therapy, maybe on my part. Um, but I do want to tell you about this, uh, what I think is a fascinating photograph. And so um, here you can obviously see that it is a horse uh, it's a cavalry horse, and um, there is a young boy who looks like he's maybe a little scared. He's got his head backed up a little bit, but he's dutifully holding the reins of the horse. On the opposite side of the horse is an officer, a Union officer. He has a double-breasted frock coat on. His sword is present. He has his cap on. He's resting one arm on the backside of the animal and the other hand is grasping his sword. And so um, uh, that's the image, right? And you see them, they're standing in front of some sort of an outbuilding. Uh, it's a wood type shed. Um, so that's the story. And you have to wonder, well, what's, what's going on here? What's the, why are they posing for this photograph? Um, what's, what's the, who are they and, and why are they there? Uh, besides the fact that the man is clearly a military officer and uh, the boy is likely related to him in some way. And in fact, he is. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the boy. Um, he's James E. Duran Jr. And um, he was born about eight years before the Civil War started. So born in 1853 and um, he was born deaf. And so um, he also did not speak. Whether or not that was a choice or um, a physical impairment, I don't know. Um, but at the time he was described as a deaf mute or deaf and mute. Nowadays that term mute is not particularly um, appreciated within the larger community of folks who are deaf or who study deafness um, because the idea of mute doesn't exactly connotate um, with the old fashioned sort of mute means dumb. Mute could be a choice for that matter. Um, anyway, he was deaf and we'll, we'll leave it at that and say that he's, he's deaf and he did not speak. Um, so the man, the officer standing on the other side of the horse or standing opposite is his father, is the boy's father. And um, this is James uh, E. Duran Sr. And um, he was born in New York. He's about 33 or 34 years old when he posed with his son for this photograph. Uh, they're both father and son lived in uh, Syracuse, New York. And so if you know the place, if you know the city, um, big city, college town nowadays, and 
fact, during the Civil War, uh, also the big city, uh, the county seat of Onondaga um, County. I believe I'm saying that correct. Um, if you know better, I'm sure you'll let me know. And um, uh, so um, uh, James was a grocer in, uh, in, in Syracuse. And when the war started, and keep in mind, I, I find no evidence that he had a military record. He doesn't appear to have belonged to a local militia company, though I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he was. Um, but, you know, he, he, uh, he got into the war effort and um, began to recruit men. He was a popular guy in town. He was known as a cheerful sort of a guy. Um, and he's the town grocer, so, uh, or at least one of the grocers in town. So he was, you know, probably had a lot of folks coming through his store, uh, knew a lot of people, probably a conversational kind of a guy. Easy to understand that. Um, several references to him being cheerful, which to me translates to somebody who engaged with his clients. So uh, James uh, Duran uh, contributes to raising a company, and that company of men from the county become the 149th New York Infantry. So um, they, um, uh, this is in the autumn of 1862, um, they follow the very familiar path of most regiments going through Washington, D.C., being assigned to the Army of the Potomac in this case, and um, joining a brigade in the 12th Corps, commanded by General Green. Um, those of you who are knowledgeable students of the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, or saw my title, you probably know uh, where this is going. Um, hey, Laura, how are you doing? I'm just seeing your, your comments. Um, so these guys, the 149th New York, they have their uh, they face their first fire at Chancellorsville, and they lose a significant number of men. And um, Duran comes out of this uh, unscathed. So uh, a couple months later at Gettysburg, uh, similar situation. They're um, in harm's way uh, at Culp's Hill, and um, they successfully defend the hill uh, on the evening of the second day of July 2nd. Um, overnight, um, uh, they're still in their position. Uh, the next morning, they get moved to a new position. And in that new position, they are filling into entrenchments that have just been abandoned by another regiment. They are filling into these trenches. You've got the Confederate forces in front of them. Uh, they are under fire at the time. There is shot and shell that's flying around, and Duran and the rest of his company and the regiment are filing into the entrenchments. Um, as this is happening, there's a realization that the regiment next to them is the 122nd New York. They were also raised in Onondaga County, so it's their brother regiment, and they really have, this is the first time that they're serving side by side in battle. So at least according to one account, these guys are so full of joy and cheer at seeing uh, their brothers from another regiment from the Syracuse area that they go crazy. They start yelling and hollering and hooting and cheering. And um, according to this one account, they're yelling so loudly that for a moment, it drowns out the din of battle all of those shots and all of those shells that, uh, that are coming in their direction. So in this moment of recognition, according to a separate newspaper article, Duran gets struck by a bullet, and that bullet hits him in the right wrist. Uh, it's described variously as his forearm or his wrist. Everyone notes, all their accounts notes that it was in the right his right arm. So forearm or wrist, somewhere around there, he takes a shot. Um, that shot disables him, and he's out of the battle at that point, goes for treatment, and ultimately is sent home to Syracuse to recover. His wife, um, Anna uh, James Jr., is there, as are um, two 
younger sisters, James's two younger sisters. So the three kids and Anna, his wife, are all there. He is uh, going into his recuperation. All is going well, but he's disabled. He's not, he's not going to um, go back to, the, um, to his role as a captain. So um, he gets a discharge in February of 1864. Now, he's discharged from the army and what happens next is he becomes involved with another regiment. Now, I'm not quite sure what his motivations are. Um, did he do it because he wanted to get back into the war? He felt he had more to offer. Um, the opportunity to lead men um, maybe was something that uh, was bigger than the crippling injury that he had had to his wrist. Um, for whatever reason, uh, still unknown, um, but he went back into the army and this time he joined the cavalry. And this is the 24th New York Cavalry. Uh, and he went in as major. So uh, he went in with a promotion from captain, which is his rank in the 149th. And that may have had something to do with it too. Uh, a chance to be a senior member of the regiment commanding troops is certainly a different experience than a captain and a company commander. So in fact, here he is, he's posed here about that time. He has the double-breasted officer's coat on, so he's clearly a major. And uh, this is in early 1864, and James Jr. is about 10 at this time. So um, uh, soon after this, James Sr. in his major's uniform rides off uh, and heads down south back to the Army of the Potomac. This time he's in the Cavalry Corps, and um, he's getting into the army during Grant's Overland Campaign of 1864. And so the 24th New York becomes seasoned rather quickly in a number of operations. As you might imagine, uh, the Overland Campaign going to uh, the front line, front line fighting, pushing towards Petersburg, pushing towards Richmond. Uh, and so all of these operations had the need for cavalry, and the 24th New York is one of those hardworking, hard-serving regiments that um, shows up in a bunch of different places. Duran is, uh, is doing his thing as a major. So uh, in March, uh, on March 31st of 1865, so a full year after this photograph was taken, uh, at Dinwiddie Courthouse, Duran is charging into battle, leading his men when a bullet finds him. And um, that bullet hits him in the right thigh and shatters his bone. That's a pretty debilitating injury at any time in life, uh, any, any time period in history, particularly difficult during the Civil War. Thigh injuries are hard to treat, upper thigh. So he's got a shattered bone. Um, his comrades are beginning to carry him back. And as they are carrying him to treatment, a second bullet hits him. And this bullet is a severe wound. It hits him in the right shoulder, literally tears through his body, um, penetrating his right lung before going out his left shoulder. So it's, without a doubt, this is a um, most likely going to be a mortal wound. So um, in the uh, chaos and confusion of battle uh, and perhaps in a dying condition, he's left um, on the ground and falls into Confederate hands. Now, there's a story uh, that I found in a fragmentary letter that is part of the Pamplin Park uh, um, collection. Uh, and in that letter, his brother describes how uh, when his brother made it down to City Point, Virginia, where James was being treated, James told the story of, of his bullet wounds. He also mentioned a woman, a, a, a Southern woman who helped nurse him um, for the short period of time that he was in Confederate hands. In fact, the Confederate uh, forces released him after, he says, 22 hours 
being a prisoner of war. So I suspect that they may have realized that James's wound was mortal. He was not going to survive or the chances were very minimal. And so they then sent him, um, they released him into Union um, safety and the Union forces bought him to sea, brought him to City Point. Um, Brother Walter gets word, comes down uh, on April 8th. So you're a day before Appomattox. Uh, and um, James is basically telling Brother Walter the story of how he became gravely wounded and was clearly going at that point. Um, it was fairly well known to both men that he wasn't going to survive uh, uh, this injury. So, and in fact, he did not. Um, but this, he does mention this Southern woman, I think the term is a Confederate woman, um, who helped take care of him and showed him some kindness uh, at some point during that very, very brief stretch of time of 22 hours. So uh, James eventually succumbs to the wound. He, he dies on April 14th, 1865, which is the same day that John Wilkes Booth assassinates President Lincoln. So uh, uh, Duran probably in his final hours, likely delirious or unconscious, not knowing what's going on, had no idea that the president had been assassinated. In fact, probably had little idea that Robert E. Lee had surrendered, probably had no idea that the war um, was pretty much over at that point. He didn't live to see any of that. Um, so uh, an embalmer um, prepared his remains and sent them to Syracuse for burial. Um, they arrive in, the remains arrive in Syracuse and um, uh, are buried in a local cemetery there. And they're buried next to his wife, Anna. Uh, Anna had died just a few months before. Um, I'm not sure of what, I don't, I don't know what her cause of death was. Um, it could possibly have been um, uh, some sort of a disease, don't know. Um, but she died before he did, and, um, and he was buried next to her, and they both rest today in the cemetery. That leaves James Jr. and his two sisters, who are now orphaned. They went into custody of a guardian, and the guardian filed for a military pension, and the funds from that pension provided money to support uh, the three kids until they were 16 years old. So there's a little detail about James Jr. Uh, despite his deafness, which would normally be a challenge for someone living in the 19th century, though there are certainly many success stories of those who uh, were able to um, work with their deafness and lead productive, normal lives. And in fact, that's what James did. Um, he became a clerk, he married, um, had a, a good solid life. Um, but his life ended tragically also. Uh, about 1905, when he was in his early 50s, he was heading over to a friend's house who was sick. He was gonna take care of his friend. And as he was making his way to his friend's house, uh, he was hit by a train and died as a result of that accident. So um, like his father, 40 years before him, um, he, um, he died too young um, or certainly died before his time. So uh, the two daughters, they did go on to live longer lives. So um, that's the story of James Duran uh, Sr. and James Duran Jr. So wanted to share that with you. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Um, to me, it's interesting. I always love the stories of the soldiers and um, finding out um, what their service is all about and learning about their motivations, uh, their circumstances. You know, each, each story is as unique as a, as a fingerprint, I think. It's also looking at these photographs. You know, on the surface we see what appears to be a father and a son and a horse, a cavalry um, soldier. And uh, you look at these photographs and you think, yeah, I wonder what, what the backstory is. Unfortunately, 
because this image was signed on the back with, uh, by Duran, we're able to trace it to his regiment and to his family and using uh, a number of resources from Pamplin Park, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, newspapers.com, which provided some very poignant articles that appeared in the local Syracuse paper about, um, about his, his life, his family, um, and how important he was to the Syracuse community. Um, his military service records, of course, and his pension file. His pension file is on uh, fold3.com in its entirety. So I was able to read through that, uh, even though we're in the middle of, or continuing in the pandemic, and the National Archives is closed, uh, able to get digital access. And also um, the uh, archives, the New York State archives, which are great um, if you haven't visited them online. Each New York regiment has its own history, including uh, these old scrapbooks that have been scanned. So it's well worth your time if you're researching New York soldiers. So that's the story. Um, hope you appreciated it. And um, I feel better having told you about it uh, because his, uh, James Duran's sacrifice and his, uh, his courage at Gettysburg the joy of the Onondaga County regiments in the middle of such a horrendous conflict along Culp's Hill has stuck with me, as I mentioned, all day today. So um, I give you that story. Um, thank you for watching and um, have a great rest of your evening. Take care. Bye.